Welcome to our talk, Level Up Your Embedded Testing Game. Um, I'm Christian, I'm with SAIS, uh, I work in the medical business sector, and this is Tobias from Innovec Innovex. Um, our third author, Stefan, could unfortunately not make it here today. Um, yeah, today we will talk about uh, requirements, automatic generation of test cases uh, in the medical field where we are working in. Um, thank you, Nicole, for giving this great introduction to functional safety in Cephal. And now we are a medical device manufacturer, size, um, who is doing similar things, and we will focus on the requirements and end testing part. Uh, but before we dive into the details, I want to take a step back. Can you go closer to the mic, please? Sure. Um, but um, before we, we dive into the details of requirements and testing, I wanted to take a step back and um, talk about why we're doing this. Um, in the end, uh, in, in the medical domain, um, everything is about trust. Um, medical personnel, patients, they need to be able to trust our machines, and, and that's what we are working for. For example, um, in this case, what you see here is, a, is an operating room. You see our um, surgical microscope up here in action. Uh, the medical personnel is helping a patient that you actually cannot see. <laughs> the patient is below their drape. So what, what's happening here is, is a brain surgery. And of course, the last thing we want to happen in this case is a failure of our instrument. Okay, this is what's driving us, but of course there are checks and balances. Um, as you know, the medical field is highly regulated, rightfully so, um, and also the regulators want us to take care of some things. And Nicole mentioned it, uh, requirements management, traceability, very important, um, and the medical field is very common to develop according to the V model, as you can see here. Uh, so we have several levels of, of requirements that are then linked with a, a satisfy link. So that's the traceability, for example, from a system requirement that is then uh, satisfied by a more detailed software requirement. We also have to verify each requirement and a test that uh, makes sure that the software requirement or any requirement is fulfilled is linked with a, a verifies trace. So this is what the regulators uh, give us as homework. Um, but there's, there's more questions that we need to take care of. For example, how do we ensure that our requirements are consistent uh, in complex medical devices as we develop them, there are thousands of requirements. How do we make sure that there's no inconsistency, that they don't um, match? Um, then there's the question, when we have a lot of requirements, how can we derive tests from those requirements? And also, in every development, requirements are changing. How do we then update the um, linked tests. And in this talk, uh, we want to talk especially about the latter two questions. This is all planned for, for today. So we have basically three steps. We have requirements, we have test cases, we have test reports. Uh, and I hand over to you, Tobias. Yes, the first part. Thanks. Yeah, so hello. Um, let me talk you through the first the first station on this on this journey, um, the NASA FRED tool, which is all about requirements. Um, you, you already heard from Christian that in order, and, and also from, from Nicole, uh, who of you attended the previous call uh, talk, um, it's all about um, uh, precisely stating what the system that, that you want to build, that you're going to produce, what, what the set is supposed to do. And requirements engineering, you might imagine, it's not that hard to write down uh, what you expect the system to do, right? Um, but everybody who's ever tried that would probably agree with me that requirements engineering actually is quite tricky. Uh, and that is basically because 
um, natural language is ambiguous and it's also prone to interpretation and interpretation errors. And there has been uh, many schools of thoughts about requirements engineering, and I'm just stating uh, three of them here, um, mainly because they also have been mentioned in the safety working group, which the two of us also uh, <coughs> have enrolled uh, into. Um, and this is, for instance, the easy approach for requirements syntax. So trying to constrain the language that you use to write down your requirements to a sensible subset. Um, in order to make them less ambiguous, so to actually precisely state uh, what you expect the system to do. Uh, in a very similar vein is the INCOSI guide to writing requirements, which is also a, a very valuable read for any one of you who has never heard about that before. Um, and for us today, um, we really um, want to do um, a, a bit of a deep dive with you onto the functional requirements elicitation tool that has been uh, authored and pioneered by a research group at NASA. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring rocket science to brain surgery. Um, we're, we're, we're not less ambitious than that. And so what is FRAID? Um, actually, it started a couple of years ago, and we, we just found it by chance. Um, this group, a robust software engineering group um, at NASA, and they put out on GitHub, and there are a couple of papers that you would find on Google Scholar site where you can read more about it. And they, they went even further than the easy approach uh, from, from Alice to Marvin um, by um, constraining the natural language even further. And what, what, what's more, what they did is they also created a tool, which you see uh, in a bit. And they're really very ambitious because obviously uh, NASA is doing mission critical uh, things. So once the rocket is up in space, no one can go up there and, and uh, fix it. It, it, has to, it has to work. Um, so what they're doing is um, they've, they've written this tool to do automated consistency and realizability checking. They're doing simulation with it. So there are many use cases which we haven't actually explored yet. Um, but the baseline of all of that is the free tool. And that's why on the next couple of slides, I'm trying to introduce to you uh, what a free requirement is. And this is the, the general structure of such a requirement, which actually has three mandatory um, components or, or, or parts to it. Uh, these are the ones with an asterisk uh, uh, applied to them. So um, the, the minimal freight requirement is component shawl response. Um, and I'll walk you through the others now. And you can follow on the slides uh, to the right uh, some of the examples for these components. And, and if you're really interested into, in, in the whole subject, I can highly uh, recommend the tutorial that the NASA team has, has put together and which I uh, basically blatantly stole uh, the, the slides or the content of the next slides from. So uh, the, the true reference is, is their tutorial. So the component obviously is what the requirement is about. So what is the system or subsystem uh, that, that the requirement applies to? Could be a flight controller, could be a lighting subsystem. Um, you would probably come up with a lot of uh, own examples. The next important thing is uh, the response from the system. That actually also contrasts the requirement from like a user story, which you might have heard from Agile, where everything is about the user and the intention of the user, which is um, uh, deliberately vague and ambiguous because there might be different ways to realize a user need, where a system requirement is the opposite. It is specific about what the system is supposed to do, so there's a change of perspective. And the response is what happens uh, or what is the system supposed to do? And these are typically the satisfy relations that Christian already mentioned. What, what properties does the system need to, uh, need to satisfy? And the FRIT syntax, the FRIT tools, allows you to also work with Boolean and arithmetic expressions. So the requirements, as you will see uh, in the examples I will show you a bit later, um, it, it is not natural language. It is more formal than a natural language requirement is. Uh, but uh, you get benefits uh, of, of doing this. Then um, another important uh, concept of a freight requirement is uh, the scope. Um, so it's all about timing. It's about what is the system also supposed to do as time progresses, as time evolves. And some requirements might only be applicable during certain moments in time, like if the system is in a certain state, like in the factory state or in the homing mode state or in, in landing, um, so this requirement does not need to hold universally, but only in this limited scope. So that's what you do with the scope. And then, um, in addition to the scope, 
there might be triggering conditions like if temperature falls below something the system is supposed to do, if time has elapsed for that and that many seconds the system is supposed to do something. So these are the triggering conditions um, and they have been um, highlighted in Fretisch with uh, what they have called keywords. And I have written down a couple of these keywords here, upon, if, where, these are triggering conditions that the parser in, in their tool is able to pick up and then do the semantic analysis of that requirement and that will become later, uh, that will become important later um, when we talk about the, the test generation. And then last but not least, um, it's about timing. Um, that's also something very interesting for a lot of the robotic systems like the microscope that Christian was referring to where actually things have to happen in a certain amount of time like within a second or within 200 ticks, uh, whatever a tick then might mean um, or it has to universally hold like always or it must never happen. So these are all timing related requirements. So that is the general structure of a Friedrich requirement. And that is all about the theory I want to uh, torture you with today. Um, I want to actually then go to a real example. Um, and we're using this tool from NASA, um, which you can download freely from their GitHub page. Um, you have to build it from source still, though, so you cannot find a binary release yet. And those of you who try will see it, it takes a bit of patience to build it initially. <laughs> it's JavaScript. Um, we as embedded software developers are not that much used to it. but if you really want to, uh, you, you can make it work. <laughs> um, and and it is, it's a very simple desktop application. Um, you can basically import and export requirements in a JSON format. Again, that will become important in the next step, that there is this easy exchange of, of data into the tool and out of the tool. And it gives you syntax highlighting, and that's what helped us a lot initially. So like the colors that we're using, actually they are baked into the tool and the tool will pick up as you write whether you are actually conforming to a freight requirement or whether you are not conforming to it. So it gives you like help. Um, it also keeps a glossary. Uh, you can see that on the right, which is also very, very handsome, simply because it keeps track of the terms that you might have already introduced in an earlier requirement. So if you use to use um, like the component to be the light controller, um, then in another requirement, you should again refer to it as the light controller and not as the light control unit, right? This is two terms meaning the same thing. So the glossary just keeps a list uh, of the, the variables as you had already defined them so that you can uh, re uh, refer to them later. Obviously, you can do metadata stuff like ID comments. Um, and it also has, and again, in particular, us as beginners, uh, we're quite happy about it. It has some built-in templates for standard use case scenarios, like if you need to describe a state machine or if you need to describe a triggering condition or something like that, then you have a drop down where you can uh, select from um, an even further refined template. So there's a lot of tooling uh, that helped us. And now that we've got the tool, we've got the theory, we probably need an example um, because this is work done with size. Um, obviously, the, the natural choice is a microscope. So let's look at a microscope. Um, actually, this one is from size, at least the, the graphics says so. But uh, we, we'd like to digitalize this microscope. So microscopes have a tube um, for focus control. A, a microscope might have a nose piece controller where you can change the objective lenses. Um, there might be a stage uh, where you put the sample on that you'd like to digitally control from a motor. And obviously, you also need to provide some light, so there might be an illumination controller. And this is just a very simple example just to walk you through. And it's also freely available at, uh, at a GitHub page of, uh, of ZEISS. So all we're talking about here today, all the contributions that ZEISS and we together made um, have been open sourced by ZEISS. It's not merged yet upstream. We're coming to the, the reasons why that is, is, has not happened yet. But if you want to check and follow along, um, everything's on GitHub for you to explore. And here are a couple of examples um, that we've just created for this artificially simple um, use case of a digital microscope. And I'm not going through to read all of them, obviously, for, for um, the brevity of time. But just maybe the first one uh, is already a very complete example. Like in sample prep or capture mode, up and request illuminate on, the illumination controller shall within 200 milliseconds satisfy 
illumination on and brightness is configured brightness and, and you get an answer back from the system. So the requirements that we were implementing in the project look very similar to this. So that's, I think, for me, it's a good compromise between this can be machine parsed and it's still readable to a human being. And there are more um, formal methods than, than the Friedrich requirements like TLA plus or uh, event B, uh, which are very formal languages. Um, but it's also, uh, it's, it's already more formal like ES or just natural language, as you can see. Um, and I've put down a few more of these requirements just on the slides. The full list is in the GitHub repo if you're interested in. Um, and you can see here, um, it's basically about uh, things that, that are being sent as a command, like up and request change objective and so forth. And you can also um, satisfy safety uh, requirements, like the second one on this slide is, is what you might consider a safety requirement where we say that in tube moving mode, uh, up and request change objective, it shall not be allowed for the nose objective controller to change the lens. That might be a safety requirement that only one, one motion is allowed at, at, a, at, a, at a time. So it's not a universal requirement to hold, but just during the tube motion phase, um, this, this needs to hold. And that's it uh, for the freed requirements uh, on the journey. I think I'll pass back to you, Christian, now for an introduction of the robot framework. Yes, thank you, Tobias. Right, so we now learned about freight. We will now look individually at a robot framework. Um, so maybe hands up, who knows the robot framework? Okay, wow, <laughs> wow. yeah, very good. Yeah, for those who don't know it, it's, it's an open source automation framework, very mature, started at Nokia. Next year, 2025, will already mark the 20th anniversary of the robot framework. So a really established framework nowadays. Um, it is keyword driven and what that means, um, I will go into detail on that in the next slide. It's versatile, supports several uh, testing methodologies um, and it is not maintained by Nokia anymore. Nowadays, it's uh, funded by the nonprofit Robot Framework Foundation. The great thing for us is it's supported by Zephyr's Twister with a few caveats. We will go in, into them later. And um, it's also human readable. Um, on the ne next slide, I want to look with you um, on a little robot example. Normally, these robot test suites, of course, they, they can contain, of course, a lot of uh, test cases, but let's, let's just pick out one. So in this case, uh, we have a test case called login with password. And this is uh, meant to test some application um, and to verify that the login with the password is working. And what you see here is the keyword-based nature of the robot framework that, that we talked about in, on the previous slide, you see that this test case is comprised of keywords. So each line you see there is a keyword. Connect to server is a keyword. Log in user is a keyword. So this is very uh, readable, but the question remains, how can such a keyword-based uh, test case be executed by software? And for this, we need to step through layers of abstraction. Uh, the next layer of abstraction, abstraction is a resource file which defines keywords. And here we see an interesting thing that, as I, to my knowledge, separates um, robot from other testing frameworks like Gherkin, for example. Um, we see that the login user keyword is defined as a set of what seems like keywords again. So we see login user takes two arguments, login and password, and then the steps that lie behind this keyword are again three other keywords, set login name, set password, execute login. So still not executable. For this, to, to understand this, we need to look at the next level. So there's a library behind it if we pick out the set login name keyword here, which is used in the login user keyword, we see the implementation. So there's a, a mapping that is defined in the robot 
from keyword name to function name in Python, just all lowercase and, and underscores between the words. And here we see we have executable Python code that, that we can run. So that's a quick look into robot. And now the question is how do we um, connect fetish requirements with uh, executable, executable robot test cases? And that's what I want to talk about in the next section. So basically, this is our workflow that we want to look at today. So from left to right, uh, this is what Tobias mentioned. We input uh, requirements that are written in the Freitish language into the NASA Freight tool. We, uh, this tool um, supports an export function. We can export the requirements um, to a JSON file. Then uh, we are open sourcing a CLI tool called Freto Robot that can do a translation from Freitish requirements exported as JSON to robot files. And this is uh, available on, on GitHub. Um, then again, we, we can rely on the robot framework to execute our test case, <coughs> which then generates a test report for us. So let's look into more detail into these steps. When we um, export fetish requirements in the FRED tool, uh, the JSON file that was mentioned is quite large, but the part that is important for us is, is this section. And you see it's quite handy. Uh, the NASA team already uh, does a lot of work for us. It already separates the requirements in a way that, it, that we can easily uh, post-process them. For example, we have the uh, component name separated out in the JSON. Um, so as I mentioned before, we take this JSON file, pass it to our command line tool, tell it the uh, output file name, the robot output file name, and what we get is test case like this. We have uh, traceability built in with the test case name, also with the tags. Um, and yeah, this is our, our test case. Now we know, okay, it, it's human readable, but how can this be executed on a machine? And this, I want to go into detail in this slide, keyword implementation, it's not just the translation tool. Um, of course, we need to tell robot what to do when it encounters certain keywords. And here we need to separate between the keywords that are given by the fetish language. This is general, this is um, general to all applications. And then there are functional keywords, keywords which are specific, specific, specific to each application, like in our case to the digital microscope application. Um, so we look first into the fetish keywords part. These are the words like upon or within X milliseconds. And here we provide uh, a FreightLib library that can be used in robot. For example, we have an implementation of the upon keyword here. And an example for a functional keyword would be request illuminate on. And there we also have a implementation here um, utilizing the Zephyr shell. Okay, so that is so far the free tool robot, the connection from with both tools using the Fate to Robot command line interface tool. And if I recall correctly, it's your turn again, yes. Tobias. All right, so we have now Freight requirements. We have a robot file that we manage to generate automatically from the Freight requirement, but now we, we wanna actually run it. So um, the next step is how did we combine the two previously mentioned technologies with the Cepha Twister framework, which obviously is available already. And this is um, the general uh, overview of what we're going to talk through now. Um, we, we like to apply the, the, the technologies, freight requirements and, and robot uh, to the application domain, which in our case is embedded computing. And obviously our firmware runs, or the size uh, firmware runs on Cepha. So that's great, hooray. 
And uh, when we started out, we also found, well, Cepha has already built in support for, um, for robot. Um, so um, we, we thought we, we had already done everything. Um, turns out it's a bit more difficult, and I come to this now. Um, but before we go into the details, just uh, a, a quick look at the general picture. So Twister is the uh, testing or it grew out of a regression test suite uh, in the upstream project, but it's now also been used for hardware in the loop testing. Some of you might have already used it. Um, so you can basically uh, set up a device on the test, um, which is in our case an embedded target and the firmware. And then the Twister framework, uh, when running tests, uh, can provide a stimuli to the device on the test and capture the response. That's why um, the, the more general term uh, for such a tool would be a test monitor. So we're talking specifically about the Twister test monitor here. And we'd like to uh, combine that with the, the robot framework. And then obviously um, the, the, uh, some, some convenience functions from such a test monitor are the setup and teardown routines. That's already built into uh, Twister, so we had not uh, to do it ourselves. Okay, so the question for us was, um, how can we make Twister run robot files? And how can we get back the robot test results uh, for, our, for our test reports? And um, some of you are probably familiar with the technologies, and some of you mentioned already, if you've looked into robot, will know that um, in, uh, in, in Twister, a couple of test frameworks are already being supported. Um, uh, the Twister language uh, calls them out as harnesses. It all started with the console harness, and these days we also have the set test harness for suffer tests. A Google test harness was added fairly recently. And more recently still, um, we have a PyTest harness and a robot harness. So we thought, well, that's okay, cool. That's all we need. Um, the other thing that the Twister project already supports is what they call handlers, um, like different uh, ways to interact with different kinds of targets. Um, there, are the, there is a handler for simulators, like the native board, native sim boards. Um, there is a QMU handler that sets up a QMU instance for you. And obviously, there's a device handler for real hardware. The first thing we had to learn, though, was that not all harnesses can be used with all handlers. So handlers and harnesses are words from the Twister uh, software design. And in particular, the robot harness is uh, today tightly coupled to a particular simulator called the Renode simulator. And I think we had a talk, uh, at least Arn Micro was here. Um, so they are the inventors and the creators of the, uh, the Renode tool, which is great because it really allows you to run a lot more simulated boards than what would be a label with QMU. Um, but ours were, were not supported. Um, in, in fact, for running uh, robot tests with the Renode simulators, right now we're limited to like five boards in tree. And ours, our boards are not in tree, and they're also not supported by the Renode simulator as such. Um, so um, that was actually uh, no way forward for us. Um, so um, we wanted to, um, we, because we wanted to run it on real hardware eventually, like hardware in the loop. Um, so that's why um, SAIS um, volunteered to invest uh, uh, efforts into creating a new harness called the Robot Framework Harness, because the noun robot was already taken uh, for, for the uh, Reno robot harness. And our goals were to obviously run robot test suites with the harness. Um, but being able to execute on any of the available handlers, like native SIM, QMU, and obviously real hardware. And we also wanted to introduce um, Cepha specific uh, robot keywords, pretty much what had already been done uh, by, by Aunt Micro for the Renode, but now applicable to, to all the other handlers, and also being independent of the transport that you would use to actually reach the target, right? And, and typically, and that's also where we started, uh, you do this with a UART and you'd start talking to the shell, but you might imagine uh, other projects or other firmware applications where you actually want to reach the target over MQTT or a CAN bus, and the implementation should be independent or should allow these extensions. And while we were looking at the Twister code, um, we eventually decided and settled on leveraging the existing PyTest integration um, from the uh, Intri PyTest Twister harness plugin. So there's a bit of a deep dive into the technical um, specialties of, of the Cepher source code. But um, we basically um, learned from what the PyTest guys were doing and reapplied it to the robot framework. So we are invoking the robot CLI in the same way as the PyTest harness is invoking the PyTest CLI for running our tests. 
uh, what was left to do for us was to figure out a way to pass the relevant information from the Twister Linux process downstream to the uh, sub-process that would then eventually run the robot CLI. Um, so that, that took us a bit. Um, and then we implement, implemented the required keywords, build on the available adapters uh, as, they, as they are available in the PyTest Twister harness. So that's what we've been working on. Um, and uh, as, as Christian already mentioned, the code has been open sourced. Um, we had to fork Cepher, um, and it's, it's on a size custodian tree. Uh, on a particular branch where you can check it out. Uh, it's based on 3.6 because that's the version of Cepher we're currently running. It probably won't apply cleanly to main at the moment, um, but there are a couple of issues we'd like to get in touch uh, with the Cepher community uh, to see uh, how we can actually merge, merge this back into, into the main branch. Um, eventually on this branch, what, what's possible to do and what was not possible previously is that you can ask for a harness robot framework and that you now can actually ask for a native SIM platform or a real hardware. So that's, that's what the, uh, the, the benefit of this work uh, will, will provide to the project once we find a way to merge it back. So this is the full, uh, the full picture now, um, bringing together the things that um, Christian and I have mentioned by now. So we have the device under test, um, we have the Twister test monitor in the middle, and on the right side, you see we start with FreeTest requirements, uh, which allows us to extract uh, test cases in, a, in an automated fashion by means of a Frick uh, test robot file. Um, you still need to implement uh, these custom keywords that Christian mentioned, like um, the general framework would not know uh, how to implement that. So that's also why it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy when you derive a, a, a test case from a requirement and that the test case is automatically fulfilled because you still need to put in uh, what, what, the what the keyword's supposed to do in terms of your application and, uh, and your implementation. But you can leverage two uh, libraries, which are either in our tree, on, in our custodian tree of Cepher, or in the, in the other um, GitHub project that Christian mentioned for the freight keywords. So I think it has become a lot more manageable uh, in order to get started uh, with these two libraries. And I think uh, that's it for the implementation. Again, come see us. Uh, we have it also running on our laptops, but we, we didn't dare to do a live demo. <laughs> and oh, just because of time, of course, right? If, if we would have had enough time, we would have run a live demo. But if you want to see it, just find us and we can, we can show it to you on, on our laptops. Um, but I guess um, it's back uh, over to you for, for the conclusions. <laughs> Yes, maybe maybe some statistics from from our our project. Um, so far, for the embedded part, we captured around 750 requirements in Fritish, and uh, with the tooling we we presented here, we derived around 600 test cases. The number of requirements is, is of course expected to grow by a factor, certainly because we're very early in the in the project. Um, maybe when you look at this number, you may be wondering why are there less test cases than requirements? And that is just uh, because of the maturity of those requirements, I would say. Um, we have cases where certain, for example, thresholds are not yet defined in the requirements. There's a TBD, so the tooling that we presented cannot derive automated test cases from those requirements. So. Um, Looking at it from the positive side uh, is certainly then that this tool provides us a kind of uh, maturity metric. Um, so maybe to sum up again, the benefits of the British requirements and test automation, why are we doing is this? I think just the summary for me is, I think this combination of tools shows how companies can benefit from open source tools. You can really stand on the shoulders of giants. We have the fetish tool from NASA, which is super helpful, which a lot of research has, has gone into. Uh, it, it allows us to um, write requirements with an unambiguous <coughs> meaning and with all the tool support so that we can immediately see while we are writing the requirements 
that if if something is wrong in in the in the wording in the in the syntax, and yet it is machine passable. Um, then we have the robot framework for automation. Um, not everyone is a software developer, so it's great to express test cases in a human readable form. And we've shown that we can um, derive fetish requirements um, into robot test cases. And then, yeah, we have the Zephyr ecosystem that we leverage. Uh, we, we, have, we have Twister, we have already built in hardware in the loop support. So um, really, I think, a convincing use case for us for open source tools. Um, as to be as mentioned, we would like to work on some improvements of the robot twister integration. Um, there was is an existing issue on GitHub regarding the um, let's say decoupling of uh, twister and renode in the case of robot test cases. And we also have a, a pull request that was not yet merged, um, that is a proposal how this could be solved following the pattern of the PyTest um, harness. Um, but during the discussion, it, it came up that there are some technical depths that we uh, need to address together. So it was not mergeable, but I think it's a good start for the discussion. So um, we would be happy if, if the community, if you, if some of you are interested, have a look at it, comment. Um, let's connect and, and see what we can achieve together. So I think with that, yeah, we are, we are closing. This is us. Um, we are here, I think, until Thursday. So if you see us, come to us. Let's chat about requirements and testing and yeah thank you maybe there are questions there are questions <laughs> where's the mic ah here we go yeah thank you very much so uh, two questions how do you do version control in this process um so everything goes back into the same git uh, effectively fretish requirements and all that so we didn't show uh, everything that we do internally. So like in a big company, of course, you do requirements management, like you have one step before. So how, we, we use an, a commercial tool to manage all the requirements and which has built in uh, version management, version control. Okay, and that tool is then linked to Fretish? Right, um, nowadays the tools luckily have uh, nice export features that also produce passable uh, results and uh, we use an, an, another parser that does the translation. Thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I have a question. Theoretically, Hagar, like about your requirements, if you have all your keywords implemented, you can simply generate like directly from your from your requirements. You can generate everything and run everything at the same time. If you have like, are you on this level, like to simply have everything reusable on your keywords and? Uh, no, it's it's like it's an iterative process. So you 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 do it step by step. So. Um, this is something which is quite nice in the robot framework. If you have keywords not implemented, the test cases will, will execute and there will be a, a message saying, okay, this and that keyword is not yet implemented. So you can do it step, step by step. Thank you. Um, your uh, keyword library for the threat requirements, the up, uh, upon, whatsoever, uh, it looked like it it's simply event handling, but what does it actually do in terms of robot framework? Does it uh, perform logging actions or is it actually preparing an environment or what does it do in the embedded terms? Oh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's, it's actually exactly what you said. It's, it's basically looking at um, triggering events, like if you see the upon um, keyword, it's supposed to send a command 
uh, and then it just forwards to the, the keyword that comes next, which is the request, and then you, you in your own code have to specify what's going on. Um, a, a few other um, uh, keywords that we have already implemented. We have by no means already implemented all the FRET keywords, just a subset that we right now need for the requirements that Christian mentioned. Uh, but for instance, we have the within keyword also, where actually um, the handler will take a timestamp before, and then it will take another timestamp when the response gets back, and then check that the response actually did receive within the specified time of 200 milliseconds or something like that. And then we have a few others, but we need to check the library of what's available. But that exactly why, why we are reaching out, um, if people are interested and you see something missing, um, we are we're happy to uh, accept contributions. No. <laughs> <laughs> How do you translate your command to uh, MQTT or to UART or to? Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So right now, um, it's it's in the. Let me go back to. This was a slide from Christian. Um, the the custom library says how the request is translated into executable code, and in this example, we're using the shell. Um, which uh, in the terminology of a Python test framework, you might call a fixture. And in and, and this line here, uh, you, you, might, you might imagine another fixture, MQTT, uh, where you then rather than sending something over the shell, you would then invoke MQTT and send a, a publish a message to a, to a topic. So it is application specific and it obviously depends on your software design. Um, so we have also been experimenting around with CAN messages because that's that's that was another thing that that we were using. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there was one more question here in the, in, in the front. Um, well, first of all, I'm uh, working on a medical device that has tries to do similar concepts, but much less um, successfully. Um, my question is, uh, how do you map these requirements on the V model? Because in V model we have refinement, but it looks like the, the requirements are flat. Yes, yeah, very good question. Um, obviously, this approach um, it addresses fairly high level requirements. Um, so it's more like at the system level because you consider the system as a black box. You're just providing stimulus to the system and then you capture the responses. So it's not unit testing what we're doing. Um, I would probably call that system requirements or subsystem requirements testing because the freightage requirements are also expressed at that level. It's not like software tests in, in the sense it's, it's systems tests. And that's why for us it was important to make them runnable on, on real hardware. That's why um, a, a simulator was not enough because eventually what size wants to do is, is run, run that on real hardware, the tests. So it's, it's a uh, higher level testing. Okay. I'm not sure if, we, if we're running out of time and if there's another call, but we, we're here for, I'm not, not sure. <laughs> Five minutes, but maybe last question. <laughs> now, how, how do you um, collect the, the feedback hey, in the case of the, um, the with that um, scope, you, you uh, drive a motor. Yeah. And how do you uh, know? Yes, that's a whole that's a whole other discussion. Uh, we, we didn't go into the details. Obviously, if you really want to check whether a motor moved to something, you also need like a, a fixture, and you need additional equipment that you can then also connect to like a, a, a GPIO a card or something where you have like a light uh, limiting switch that you can read out. Um, so, but that all would become part of the test fixture um, and you then need to implement that within, within your test fixture. But we, uh, we didn't talk about that here. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. Yeah, thank you for the questions. <laughs>